Welcome to a video about Intel's upcoming XE HPG cards, standing for High Performance Gaming. EA Sports, it's in the game. HPG, it's in the name. And it hopefully will not disappoint. It will really be 20 years, 20 years, since we had more than two discrete graphics vendors in the PC market. Around the 90s, there was a diverse set of vendors, we had 3DFX, ST Graphics, Matrox and ST Microelectronics, the latter using Power via IP. For the 3D Labs, Number 9 and Redemption were also on the market. In 1998, Intel released their first discrete graphics card called i7040 in collaboration with Real 3D. It was unfortunately also the last GPU card from Intel until very recently when they brought DG1 and SG1 onto the market. However, DG1 is not directly available in the consumer channel, you can only buy it through pre-built systems and SG1 is targeting the server market. Gamers Nexus did a review of the DG1 and it achieves around Nvidia GT1030 performance, although with terrible frame pacing back then, which is perceived as micro starters in games. Moreover, the market volume is really small, so even though that was Intel's first discrete graphics card, after more than 20 years, it obviously wasn't a great entrance into the market again and nothing which would get gamers excited. ATI and Nvidia were inside the 3D market since the beginning and I believe it was Matrox with the Pahelia in 2002 who was the last one to bite the dust. So since 2002, serious gamers only got the option between ATI slash AMD and Nvidia. It felt like that this will be the case till the end of time. But in the first and second quarter of 2022, Intel will break the state of the world with their new XE HPG Alchemist offering. It's not going to be the full metal alchemist, it's the half metal alchemist or mixed metal alchemist. Definitely some alchemist, and it looks <laughs> good! <laughs> Seriously, the paper specs are impressive, so let's go through them step by step. Every hardware vendor is using a high level module, a bundle of different hardware blocks to scale up and down the GPU configurations. For high end GPUs, multiple modules are used, for low end products, maybe just one. Some internal aspects of those modules are sometimes also scaled up and down. Intel called such a high level unit a render slice. It contains multiple fixed function hardware and programmable logic to calculate the 3D pipeline. From the fixed function perspective, we start with the geometry engine, which is assembling vertices to triangles, is doing clipping, some form of culling, and passes the fine geometry data to the rasterizer. Intel did not specify how the geometry unit works and what the throughput numbers are. However, I would imagine that it's similar to the low power predecessor XELP. One geometry engine there can cut two back facing triangles per clock and likely pass one triangle per clock to the rasterizer. That rasterizer on Alchemist should write out 16 pixels per clock to match the random backend throughput. There are two pixel backends, each one with 8 color ops, which together output 16 pixels per clock. Between the fixed function stages, we have programmable vector engines, which are used for the calculation of vertex, pixel, compute shaders, and so on. An array of vector engines share one instruction cache, the load and store units, the L1 data cache, and a certain amount of scratch pad memory. Together they form another subblock, which Intel calls an XE core. Surprisingly, the company does not include the ray tracing units and texture samplers anymore, but list them separately as part of the fixed function building block. Nonetheless, they logically belong together and previously Intel called such a building block an XE subslice with 16 execution units. Intel said they changed terminology because execution units are becoming too large to reason about and that architecture changes make a comparison suboptimal. But from a high level view, it's just a renaming. A vector engine is 256 bit wide which means that we are still looking at a SIMD8 unit where each lane can process a 32-bit operation. Intel draws two vector engines as a pair, which most likely means that they share the thread control unit as previously. 
What's new and kinda amazing is the Matrix engine, which is 1024 bit wide. Intel did not say what kind of data formats it can handle, but XEHPC slash Pontevecchio is supporting 8 bit integer, 16 bit floating point, 16 bit brain floating point, and TensorFloat32. The last one is a misleading name and better should have been called 19 bit brain floating point. XEHPG will likely support the same data inputs, or at least int 8, FP16, and BF16. The matrix engines themselves are not that large in comparison to the competition or Intel's own HPC variant, but Intel has a lot of them per XE core, one per vector engine, so also 16 in total. Let's summarize the throughput numbers per clock for one render slice. The geometry unit can likely deliver one triangle per clock for drawing and call two triangles per clock. The front-end rasterizer should deliver 16 pixels per clock and the back-end rasterizers, also known as ROPs, should do the same. So we have a one-to-one -one ratio. After that, we are looking at the XE cores, where each one has 128 FP32 bit shader cores, from a simplified marketing perspective. Each shader core can execute one fused multiplier add operation, which the marketing guys like to count as two operations, one for the multiplication parts and the other for the addition. Therefore, from a marketing standard perspective, each XE core performs 256 32-bit floating point operations per clock. Furthermore, the core should support double rate FP16, which would result in 512 16-bit FP operations per clock. A new addition to XELP with dot product instructions for 8-bit integer calculations, where four 8-bit multiplications are done and the results are added to a 32-bit integer accumulator. With those instructions, we would count 1024 8-bit integer operations per clock. Since a render slice has 4 XE cores, we can quadruple all throughput numbers per clock. On the matrix side, we have 16 1024-bit engines, which means 16384 bits per XE core. They also do multiply add operations with int 8, FP16, BF16, and perhaps TF32. For TensorFlow 32, we would get 1024 19-bit FP operations per clock. Twice as much with FP16 or BF16, meaning 2048 16-bit operations. And lastly, 4096 8-bit integer ops. So in comparison to the vector engines, the matrix units are providing four times the throughput. As far as I understood, XEHPC can co issue vector and matrix instructions at the same time. XEHPG likely has the same capabilities. Next up are the texture samplers with 8 units, where each unit can output 1 texture per clock, leading to 8 texels per XE core and 32 texels for the whole XE render slice. Lastly, a render slice has 4 ray tracing units, 1 per XE core. That's another very important feature of XE HPG. Intel is stating that each ray tracing unit is hand linked intersection tests with box and triangle nodes and accelerates the traversal of the bounding volume hierarchy. There's a white paper from Imagination which is classifying the ray tracing capabilities into six levels from level 0 to level 5. Level 0 is about all the hardware and proprietary software solutions, it's mostly a point about the past. Level 1 is more or less describing recent hardware and software APIs the ray tracing calculations are executed on shader cores. This can be even practical for real-time ray tracing, but only within a limited scope. In general terms, it's not fast enough. There are some media outlets, like PC Games Hardware, which benchmark the XR-enabled games on Nvidia's Pascal GPUs. The results vary from pretty playable on high-end and performance GPUs, well under 1080p on Battle 5 so let's look at this nice slideshow of Metro Exodus and Shade of the Tomb Raider. To make real-time ray tracing much more practical, some dedicated hardware acceleration is necessary. That's where level 2 comes into play, what Imagination describes as the foundation for real-time ray tracing. Extra hardware is built in to accelerate bounding box and triangle intersections. Level 3 is about offloading the traversal through the bounding volume hierarchy, which Intel's ray tracing units are capable of. Based on the white paper, Intel is using a level 3 solution. For level 4, coherency sorting in hardware gets included, where the task is to find rays, which follow a similar path, and to schedule those as a bundle, instead of suffering a highly divergent execution flow 
with bad cache hit rates and wasteful memory access. It is described as a must-have feature to enable ray tracing on smartphone devices. The last level adds dedicated hardware, which dynamically creates and adjusts the bonding volume hierarchy for the scene. This white paper can be seen as a roadmap for features, which we are going to witness from AMD, Intel and Nvidia in the near future. Obviously, that's not the ultimate truth, the order of new capabilities is not set in stone and there are many things which can be done. Furthermore, the implementation details also matter a lot. Imagination themselves already has level 5 hardware, however, not inside the current graphics IP. And for the usual gaming landscape, they are irrelevant right now. That's of course quite unfortunate, we would like to test advanced ray tracing hardware and see if the marketing claims hold up to practical results. Anyway, outside of the high level features, Intel is not sharing throughput numbers for the ray tracing units, as such we don't know how many intersection tests each unit can compute per clock. This concludes our summary for next year render slice, and now let's compare that to the competition starting with AMD. What Intel is calling a render slice, Team Red is calling a shader engine. We are looking at a shader engine from Navi 22, which is based on the RDNA2 micro architecture and the closest competitor to DG2512 from Intel, the top mod of the XE Alchemist generation. The hardware blocks, which are bundled together, are basically the same as on Intel. We have fixed function geometry engines, rasterizers, ROPs, texture mapping units, dedicated ray tracing acceleration, and of course, a number of programmable vector engines. Let's begin with the geometry engine again, or called primitive units under RDNA. It can output one triangle to the rasterizer and call two triangles per clock. The rasterizer block has a higher throughput than on Intel, instead of 16 pixels per clock, it emits 32. As Intel, AMD is using 8 color ops per render backend, but to match the pixel frontend throughput, a shader engine has 4 of those for 32 pixels per clock instead of just 2. What is known as Next E Core on Intel, AMD is calling a workgroup processor, a collection of vector engines, texture mapping units, ray tracing accelerators, data caches, and a scratchpad memory. However, even from a high level view, there are many architectural differences. XE Alchemist is using 16 SIMD8 units, or more precisely, 8 SIMD8 pairs, which in some marketing terms would mean 128 shader cores. MD is using much wider SIMD engines instead, with 32 lanes slash 1024 bit. Each WGP has 4 SIMD engines, so again simplified to marketing numbers, we are also talking about 128 shader cores. A little detail on a side note, the WGP can work in two different modes. It can work in the WGP mode, where all ways from a workgroup are scheduled to all 4 SIMD units. They have access to the whole 128 KB scratchpad memory, called local data share, which Intel called shared local memory. As always, we have 20 different names for basically the same thing, and this applies to all structures. Anyhow, what isn't so great about this mode are the two separate data caches, which have no cache coherency between each other and require extra care. This is not elegant and very likely an aspect which AMD is going to change with RDNA 3. Then there's the compute unit mode, which is dividing the WGP in two logical units. The waste from a workgroup are then only scheduled on two SIMD units, only half of the local data share is available, and you don't have to deal with incoherent data caches. I mention this because many are likely more familiar with the compute unit terminology, which is still oftentimes used in parallel for RDNA and means in this case 64 shader cores per compute unit. In terms of throughput, we have nearly the same outcome as on Intel, with 256 FP32 bit operations per clock. Packed FP16 is supported, also mixed dot product instructions with 8 bit integers. In addition, AMD is supporting dot product instructions with 4 bit integers, doubling the throughput again. For Navi 22, AMD is using 10 WGPs per shade engine, so over twice as many processing blocks per high level module. Since AMD is currently lacking dedicated matrix engines, that's the maximum compute throughput one is getting. On the texture mapping side, we have 8 texture samplers per WGP, totaling to 80 texels per clock for one shader engine. With RDNA2, AMD added dedicated ray tracing accelerators, there's one per compute unit or two per WGP. 
Contrary to the competition, AMD is currently the only one who is setting clear throughput numbers. Each ray tracing accelerator can compute four ray box intersections or one ray triangle intersection. A shader engine provides in total 80 box intersections per clock, respectively 20 triangle intersections. However, what the current ray accelerators are not providing is the ability to traverse through the bounding volume hierarchy, that task is managed by the shader cores. Imagination would classify it as a level 2 ray tracing implementation in comparison to level 3 on Intel. Let's go through the same game on the Nvidia side. Our reference will be the GA104 chip, again the closest competitor of Intel's upcoming GPU flagship. The high level block unit here is not called a render slice or shader engine, we are talking about a graphics processing cluster. Again, the hardware blocks included are basically the same. From a high level view of course, like up in the sky a wolf and a sheep look like the same animal. Needless to say, there are millions of differences between the vendors, but the scaling principles are really close together. Starting with the front end, there are some differences in comparison to AMD and Intel. Nvidia is not using a fixed amount of geometry units per GPC, which are called polymorph engines, but is scaling them per TPC, texture processing cluster, where each TPC includes two SMs, streaming multiprocessors. The TPC is an intermediate subblock, which is not present in that form on AMD or Intel. Before TPCs, the chip has four geometry units per GPC, other chips can have more or less than that. Since the Fermi Micro architecture in 2010, Nvidia has a very scalable geometry frontend. Unfortunately, it's been a while since Nvidia shared throughput numbers for a polymorph engine. On Kepler, a triangle was done after two clock cycles, or you could say half a triangle per clock. This appears to have been true, at least up to Pascal, and perhaps may still be the case on Ampere. If you simplify it, for polymorph engines, would net us two triangles per clock. But that's probably the maximum culling rate, which usually was much higher on Nvidia GPUs than the rasterized triangle rate. The rasterizer is rasterizing one triangle per clock, this seems to apply to all three hardware vendors. As with Intel, Nvidia's rasterizer is outputting 16 pixels per clock in the end. And again similar to Intel, they are using two rendering backends with 8 color ops each, which also results in 16 pixels per clock. Akin to the XE core on Intel and the workgroup processor on AMD, Nvidia is calling a block which binds vector engines, matrix engines, texture mapping units, ray tracing cores, a local data cache and scratch with memory, a streaming multiprocessor. NSM includes four subcores. Each one has two vector data paths which can do work per clock cycle. The first data path includes two SIMD units with 16 lanes for 32-bit floating point or 32-bit integer operations per clock cycle. Just to be explicitly clear, they can't be used at the same time. The other data path includes one SIMD unit with 16 lanes which can only compute floating point math per clock. If you simplify all that, each SM has 128 FP32 shader cores in total. What a coincidence that all three vendors use the same marketing number per processing block. In terms of throughput, it gets interesting on the Nvidia side because of the asymmetric vector capabilities and balance point. For FP32, the throughput can be as high as on the competition. With 32-bit integer operations, the execution rate is halved on Ampere, but the same could be roughly true for Intel, at least XELP still doesn't appear to use integer multiplier at execution units, and most AMD GPUs are awfully slow with 32-bit integer multiplications. Non-matrix operations for FP16 and BF16 are supported, though those operations are nonetheless routed through the matrix engines, which Nvidia calls tensor cores. The total throughput is the same as with FP32, but one advantage is the ability to co-issue 32 and 16-bit operations. Another topic is the int8 throughput. On Volta and Turing, Nvidia claimed four times the throughput with int8 on the CUDA cores. That's likely pointing towards third product instructions as they were supported on Pascal. However, Nvidia is not explicitly mentioning that anymore and how it's implemented on Ampere. I would guess it's only supported by the first data path, which has the integer and floating point SIMD engines. Since a GPC from the GA104 has 8 SM units, we are getting 2048 FP32 operations per clock cycle, twice as much as on Intel and a bit below the throughput numbers of the Navi22 shader engine. 
For the shader cooperation types, it looks quite different though. Beyond that, NVIDIA's matrix engines, which are twice as wide as on its upcoming XE Alchemist chips. One tensor core should have 2048 bits. Since we have 4 pairs M, we are looking at a total of 8192 bits, which is now half as much as on Intel GPUs. So Nvidia is using larger engines, but far less of them. They support the same data inputs as Intel's upcoming XE cards, but also integer 4-bit operations and even 1-bit integer ops, which are not listed in the table because reasons. Moreover, Nvidia supports a sparsity feature, which is pruning matrices, compresses them and achieves effectively twice the throughput without affecting the results much or at all. However, this is apparently much easier to achieve for inferencing than for training applications. For real workloads, Nvidia presented a speed up of 30 to 60%. Per GPC, the GA104 has the same matrix bit mass as one XE render slice. Nonetheless, it could be that only the integer 8 bit throughput is the same. For floating point operations, the throughput is just half as much when 32 bit accumulation is used. People who love and trust marketing material can double all theoretical matrix throughput numbers on Nvidia's chip with the sparsity feature. Moving on to the texture samplers, there are 4 pairs M, and with 8 SMs, a GPC can produce 32 texels per clock as a render slice on Intel's Alchemist. Turning to ray tracing. Of the desktop vendors, Nvidia was the first one to introduce real time ray tracing capabilities with Turing in 2018. The green team already started with a level 3 hardware implementation of loading BVH traversal and ray box and ray triangle intersections on dedicated hardware, which they call the ray tracing core. Nvidia is not stating throughput numbers, but benchmarks are showing that the ray tracing hardware inside Turing is superior to AMD's RDNA2 implementation, where the performance is suffering far more, in relative terms, when ray tracing is used. For Ampere, Nvidia doubled the throughput of the ray triangle intersection tests. In addition, there's a new interpolate triangle position unit, which heavily speeds up the calculations for motion blur effects. However, developers have to specify motion paths for the geometry, which currently appears to be only possible through Nvidia's Optics API 7 and newer. So this doesn't work automatically and through cross vendor APIs, but it shows what kind of innovations are possible in hardware and what may happen in the future for all vendors and other APIs. Now we can directly compare the theoretical throughput numbers for one high level module. In that regard, Intel and Nvidia are relatively close together, sharing the same triangle, pixel and texel rate. Moreover, both have a level 3 ray tracing implementation. Differences are found on the shader core side, where Nvidia delivers twice the FP32 throughput, while on the matrix side Intel has the upper hand for floating point calculations if they use 32-bit accumulators without a reduction in throughput. AMD, on the other hand, presents a quite different balance point. The triangle rate is similar, but the pixel rate per clock is twice as high. In addition, AMD uses much more compute blocks per graphics cluster, which leads to a texture rate of 80 per clock and the highest throughput numbers on the shader core side. Relative to the vector capabilities, the geometry throughput is really meager. After having the numbers for one high level module, we can scale it up to the real chip configurations. DG2512 from Intel is using 8 render slices, which means that we can multiply all previous numbers by 8. We will compare all chips in a moment, but it can already be said that Intel has a massive raw power behind DG2512. AMD is using the largest graphics clusters from all vendors, offering twice the pixel fill rate and much more shader core power. As such, it's not surprising that the company uses fewer graphics clusters than the competition, however Navi22 is really just using two shader engines. This leads to theoretical numbers, which are far behind those of the DG2 and GA104 chip. The latter falls between Intel and AMD, with the usage of six graphics processing clusters. We will look at two Nvidia products, which use the GA104 chip. The current top SKU is the 3070 Ti, which is equipped with a fully enabled chip and quite expensive. More attractive is the 3070, which is disabling only one texture processing cluster, which means just a couple of different units are missing. The comparison between all chips gives away the impression that Navi22 does not belong there. 
It has just a quarter of the geometry throughput of DG2, half of the pixel free rate and about 63% of the FP32 and text free rate per clock. Comparing it to the J104 is drawing a better picture for the AMD chip, but ultimately just somewhat less bad. One third of the geometry throughput is still a lot less, together with just two thirds of the pixel and 83% of the text free rate. The comparison between DG2 and the J104 appears much more even, where each chip has some points speaking for it. On Intel's chip, it's the massive 3D front and backend. Neither AMD nor Nvidia built a gaming chip yet that has 8 geometry engines and rasterizer plus a pixel rate of 128 per clock. AMD's current top dock, Navi21, has 4 geometry engines and a pixel rate of 128 per clock. Nvidia's high-end chip, the GA102, uses 7 GPCs, just one more than the GA104 chip, which translates to 7 rasterizers and a pixel rate of 112 per clock. So in that regard, Intel's chip is structured like an absolute high-end GPU and it will be fascinating to see how well the geometry distribution and rasterization pipeline will work on Intel. AMD is very reluctant to scale that up in terms of width since Hawaii in 2013. Seeing Intel using straight up the widest 3D engine is quite a surprise. Besides that, similar to the geometry and pixel rate, the Texel Matrix Integer 8 throughput is also one third larger per clock on DG2 in comparison to the J104. It looks 2.7 times as good for matrix floating point operations if Intel uses a fast implementation with 32 bit accumulation than Nvidia. A point for the NVIDIA chip is the incredible vector floating point 32-bit throughput, which is 50% higher than on the DG2 chip and 2.4 times as much as on Navi22. In relative terms, all MPGPUs are FP32 throughput monsters, at least on paper. And a final remark on the ray tracing unit count. That's the only point where Intel is looking the worst, with just 32 units, in comparison to 40 on Navi22 and 48 on the GA104. However, I would assume that Intel's units are not slower per clock than AMD's and with PVH traverse acceleration I expect better ray tracing performance in relative terms even if the total unit count is lower. Now, I am obviously comparing the throughput numbers per clock, but the three chips are not running at the same clock speed, which is another major part of the chip design and there can be some large differences which change the relative throughput numbers substantially. So I'm going to peel the next layer of the onion and we will arrive at the final throughput numbers for the end products. On the architecture day, Intel claimed that XE HPG can achieve over 50% higher frequency and performance per watt in comparison to XE LP. For the low power predecessor, Intel claimed a frequency range of up to 1.7 or even 1.8 GHz. 50% on top of that would result in 2.6 slash 2.7 GHz. That would be a very high frequency. XELP under DG1 was specified with a clock speed of up to 1.65 GHz, but the passively cooled ASUS model only ran at 1.5 GHz under Rocket League and throttled down to 1.4 GHz when reaching a higher temperature. Although DG2 will be air cooled, it may be more realistic to take this as a baseline for clock speeds rather than an unspecified voltage range from Intel. This would align with claims made by Moore's Law is Dead or rather set his sources, which mention 2.2 GHz and above, like 2.3 and 2.4 for the top model. Recently Leakbench found a Geekbench entry for the small DG2 128 chip with a reported clock speed of 2.2 GHz, so that would align if no tricks are played. Previously, Apisak found an entry for DG2 512 with 1.8 GHz on Geekbench. According to Igor Slab, that's the planned clock frequency for the mobile products. As such, I'm going to use 1.8 and 2.2 GHz for the final throughput numbers. If Intel achieves more than that on average, then even better. Clock frequency was a topic where AMD surprised me quite a lot. Based on the new microarchitecture design RDNA in 2019, which reached about 1.8 to 1.9 GHz, I expected about 2 GHz from RDNA 2, but really not much more. I especially did not expect a console to run at 2GHz and above for efficiency reasons. However, we got a PlayStation 5 running at up to 2.23GHz and AMD's desktop GPUs achieve even more. 
A high frequency design itself is not something special. Every larger chip company can build products with a high clock speed. But building a high frequency design, which is doing a lot of useful work and keeps energy efficiency high, that's impressive. Exactly this feat AMD's GPU team pulled off and claim a 30% frequency increase for the same power, which can be largely confirmed by gaming benchmarks. The 6700XT, which is going to be the reference for Navi22, is clocking on average at 2.531 GHz under 16 games, benchmarked by computer base at 1440p. That's just a little bit under the advertised maximum clock frequency of 2.581 GHz, which is not a real maximum clock frequency because under some games the GPU is running over 2.6 GHz. Nonetheless, I'm going to use the official max clock and the measured average number. Last but not least, the Ampere chip from NVIDIA. For the 3070 and 3070 Ti, the company is stating a boost frequency somewhat above 1.7 GHz. In practice though, they're running with about 1.9 GHz on average, again based on numbers from computer base, this time taken from 17 games at 1440p. This obviously means that AMD's GPU is clocking significantly higher and that Intel is also likely a notch above that. Everything together leads to the final throughput comparison. Relative to before, AMD's position improved the most since Navi22 runs with the highest clock rates. If Digi2512 has a clock speed of 2.2 or 2.3 GHz in practice, AMD would enjoy a clock advantage of 10 to 15%. With 2.2 GHz, Intel's Alchemist GPU would not have 4 times the geometry throughput anymore, but only 3.5 times as much. Further, instead of twice the pixel through rate, the advantage would be just 74%. It's of course apparent that 15% clock advantage for AMD is not changing the picture significantly. And so on paper, Digi2 continues to play in another league. The situation is quite different with the GA100 though. Due to 1.9 GHz clock frequency, it loses a lot of ground relative to the competition. Navi22 clocks 32 to 35% faster, so in relative terms the geometry throughput advantage goes down from factor 3 to 2.3. Of course, that is still a lot. However, the pixel free rate lead of 50% per clock melts down to 14%, bringing both GPUs much closer together there. On the texture rate side, the picture flips, but the 20% higher total throughput per clock on the GA104 is not enough to offset the higher clock rate of Navi22, which wins that paper battle by 12 to 15% now. But there's no cure for the massive FP32 shader core throughput on the GA104 which still leads by a gigantic amount of 74%. Against the GA104, the DG2512 wins comfortably in almost all points by over 50% now, be it geometry, pixel, texture rate or matrix engine throughput. Only on the FP32 shader core side, Nvidia's chip is able to edge out DG2512 by 28%. After taking the clock speed into consideration, Navi22 and GA104 came significantly closer together. Nevertheless, without knowing many other important factors, a simple look at the high level specs would probably still tell most people that the GA104 should lead by a strong margin. A look at Intel's GG2 paints a picture that is much more reminiscent of a high-end GPU chip, more comparable to a cut-down version of Navi21 or the GA102 chip, like the Radeon 6800 or GeForce 3080. While we have to wait a little longer before we can judge the DG2 performance, we already have many benchmarks of the 6700XT and the 3070 3070Ti, and they are very close together. Based on the computer based index, the 3070 is just 10% faster than Navi22, and the 3070Ti achieves a lead of 16%. However, it's also using a much higher power target, significantly more raw bandwidth and costs officially $100 more, so it's not a direct competitor in this case. What the results show is something which many tech enthusiasts know since a very long time. High level raw specs can be very deceiving and far apart from practical performance. There are so many other details which are important, like internal execution latencies, cache and buffer structures, how many resources are available per compute unit, what execution pipelines can work at the same time, be efficiently utilized, and what bottlenecks really occur under applications. Moreover, GPUs are very dependent on the software stack. 
Compilers, drivers and application optimizations are very important to get a hardware foundation to perform well. In that regard Intel has probably a lot of work to do. So even though the raw specification looks incredible, we are likely having a similar situation where DG2 does not perform as good as you would expect based on the spec sheet. If the leak from Bushi 1T Buster is legit, Intel sees DG2 512 as a competitor for the GeForce 3070 in Radeon 6700 XT. The thermal design power is basically the same for all of them. To some degree that's a positive sign, similar performance levels with similar power consumption. Since the alleged Intel slide is quite old, it's possible that Intel may also target the 3070 Ti and push the power limit a bit up. That said, I'm going to make a cut here, otherwise the video would go on for another half an hour. I hope it was interesting so far and I see you in the second part. Goodbye.